This week and next week are devoted to the subnational aspects of coordination, which are often overlooked in security sector discussions of this issue, but are equally important to consider when we are trying to coordinate to counter transnational organized crime. So today and next week, I encourage you to think about what kinds of strategies need to be pursued and what kinds of actions need to be taken on the community or the provincial levels for the coordination efforts of different African states to resonate with populations. Now for strategies to resonate with populations, security and justice actors need to come up with approaches that address the political, the economic, and the social realities of the of citizens' experiences with crime, both in urban areas and rural areas. And if they do not do this, then African state actors are unlikely to gain people's trust in the state's attempts at rolling out any sort of coordinated response. So for coordination strategies to really work in practice and actually dismantle some of these networks, the inclusion and the buy-in of citizens and communities in both urban and rural settings is essential. Some of the major urban features of transnational organized crime that um, are notable, deserve further examination, might include criminal gangs entrenchment in cities and suburbs, the exploitation of air and seaports to carry out transnational organized crime, and certain high-level officials' use of their power to facilitate transnational organized crime through their work in state institutions, many of which tend to be concentrated in urban capital cities. In terms of rural areas and particularly rural border areas, these are also critical for coordination strategies and policies to counter crime uh, to, 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 to consider. There are social and cultural ties that people share in border areas that create potential for good coordination, um, but criminal networks also choose to exploit these border areas. So state actors challenge here is to provide services and connect with border populations in ways that build their trust in state efforts to coordinate the fight against organized crime. So with that, on to today's panel. So we have uh, several objectives, uh, learning objectives. Today we wish to analyze what are the risks and the resilience that our communities have in terms of TOC in the urban areas as well as the rural areas and the border areas? We want to evaluate the elements of coordination of security that uh, are the most important in the development of the responses of the state to uh, TOC in urban areas as well as in rural areas. So I'm delighted to uh, welcome two experts that who are going to speak to us today. You have their biographies on our website. I would just like to bring out a few aspects of their experience. Dr. Marcel Aite Baglo is the Director General of the Beninese Agency for Integrated Border Management since 2012. And he is also the assistant professor of universities and consultant to the World Bank. Dr. Baglo previously served as the director general of the Beninese Agency for the Environment and director general of the administration of the territory and permanent secretary of the National Border Commission. In this last position, he coordinated the development of the national border policy and the implementation through the securing of border areas, the improvement of the living conditions of border populations, and the promotion of cross-border cooperation. He is an expert of the United Nations Center for Counterterrorism. We also have with us today, Mr. Charles Tilgarepi Gordema. He is an independent senior research consultant with a recent focus on the intersections between urbanization and criminal governance. He is the founding director of Informed Solutions to Economic Crime in Africa, a consultancy which collects, collates, and analyzes information relevant to mitigating the incidence and the impact of cross-border economic crime in Africa. He led a team which conducted research into and provided capacity support to 
combat organized crime uh, in Africa while he was with the Institute for Security Studies. His work then covered Southern Africa, but has since extended beyond the subregion to track the major routes and trends of illicit asset transfers affecting African economies. Charles has assisted institutions such as the African Development Bank, the African Legal Support Facility, and the Intergovernmental Action Group Against Money Laundering in West Africa, or GIABA, to develop strategic plans targeting illicit financial flows. He's also a member of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crimes Network of Experts. He previously worked on projects uh, with transnational threats and international crimes at ISS Africa and is a lawyer by training, including a stint in the prosecution of economic crime. So welcome to both of our uh, distinguished panelists and we'll begin the conversation. Thank you. Hello, Dr. Baglo. Dr. Baglo, je vais tourner vers vous d'abord avec trois questions. Dr. Baglo, I'm going to ask you three questions. The first questions that I would like to ask you, you'll have about seven minutes to answer them all. First question. Who are the actors and what are the markets involved in TOC in the rural border areas in which your agency works? Thank you so much, Kate. As in many African countries in general, Benin has four types of actors. There are the actors that are connected to mafiosa style actors and in countries such as our own, but there are other actors as well. The most important are the state actors, the embedded state actors who through their own interests uh, aid and facilitate corruption. And these are the main principal actors in Benin. So one of the important, since 2016, the fight against corruption, uh, for this we have created a special institution to um, put a stop to this. We noted uh, that on another hand, everything, all the crime we see near the borders are, uh, we see that the populations are being exploited. So uh, Cote d'Ivoire, for example, uh, the, with the border, even if you have a passport or you don't have a passport, with money you can pass the borders. So the corruption is terrible on the borders. And these economic crimes for traffickers is a terrible thing for our country. On the border regions, the pressure on the security forces uh, is difficult with the population because the population does not trust the security forces. They consider that they are the enemy. And so it, they consider the security forces as being their oppressors. So it's important to put into place um, institutions and, and frameworks to fight against this situation. The second group is the, are the criminal networks that are the actors that we um, see most often in, within this space. If you understand how the borders work, oftentimes the state is, is missing from these uh, areas. The populations are very poor and they feel abandoned by the state. And these are very remote, almost inaccessible areas. And so because they are remote and and very and, and not well developed, the state is often replaced by the violent entrepreneurs uh, cr with criminal activities. Uh, and this give, th th these people, the criminals give all the essential, meet the essential needs of the populations, water, food, et cetera. And so, uh, the population becomes collaborators of these criminal elements without even realizing it sometimes. And the criminals give them schooling, health services, food, and this facilitates, enables uh, the criminal networks who uh, are, are well 
embedded on the border areas of West Africa. And we see that it's very simple to go from one country to another within these countries. Also, on the borders, the security forces often refrain from going in those areas in to the border areas and therefore they become free zones burkina mali niger um, other countries these are open territories where the state is absent and is replaced by the criminal um, persons and in many african countries we have much illicit traffic, uh, human trafficking, drug trafficking, oil trafficking, all sorts of trafficking between countries. The third actor that we have are the foreign actors. The foreign actors in our country are, are uh, groups that uh, where uh, groups where the, the, the heads are, the leaders are in other countries and the um, there's a traffic of petrol, for example, in Nigeria, and in Benin, other products. They, they 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 the products travel from one country to another. Benin, Togo, and it's like a drug trafficking. And this country, our country, has become a a, a transit area for this crime. And those uh these we become countries of transit. And so today, the crimes we see, for example, of uh, elephant tusks, these are, these are crimes for which we become transit areas. And uh, today, in our country, we have put into place, we have put into place certain uh, uh, surveillance and 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 to to end this kind of traffic. We have also the problem of hostage taking and kidnapping with ransom demands. Uh, this is common also in West Africa. The in different countries. So it whether it's in Burkina, whether it's in Bena or the countries when they kidnap and take hostages, they ask ransoms. And once they get their ransom, they, they let the people go. But we have a, a large number of, of these issues. And then we have cyber criminals that are uh, more and more organized and uh, they work individually or in, but more and more in organized groups and and they use uh, the internet to to uh, uh, to put people to to convince people to to work for them and we also have uh, in terms of TOC, we have all sorts of illicit traffic, human trafficking, uh, fa fake medication, fake pharmaceuticals, and traffic of wildlife, tra drug trafficking, and uh, also drugs that are of less uh, value and importance. But we have also more and more, we are seeing the theft of, of, of livestock also. Uh, this, in Abidjan, we find, for example, uh, uh, animals that are stolen by the terrorists, uh, livestock stolen by the terrorists. And so there are links between these different groups uh, and we find them in the different markets. There's also the contraband smuggling of cars of coming from the Gulf countries. And so we have a number of illicit markets that uh, are in our country. 
And so there are pro essential questions of who is going to be in charge? How will we fight this? We're, we need to see the link between terrorism and these illicit markets because the, the terrorists need resources. And the criminals, the, uh, the TOC entities, uh, are making a mess of things all over the place and they upend the order everywhere. And so therefore, in West Africa today, we have a documentary on arms trafficking in Mali, where the terrorists were uh, attacked by the army, but they are, uh, the, the, the terrorists are actually gaining access to arms and then selling them illicitly. In an open air, oh, they're selling them openly. They don't even hide it. And all of this is mostly on the border areas with whether uh, it's the region of the three rivers, wherever it is, these are the situations that we have today. And this, these are the threats coming from criminal activity. And these are the actors that we have, um, uh, the markets that are exploited by the criminals on our uh, border areas. Thank you so much for your answer. A uh, second question that I have for you that uh, for our discussion, how would you assess the prospects for community resilience to TOC in these areas? And what factors play into that assessment? At, in my country and other countries of the sub region, uh, Toga, Burkina, for example, we have uh, a response that is quite weak uh, against uh, TOC. What did they do? What did we do in Benin? We started by giving, by putting actions into place to give the population a feeling of belonging. As I said, in the border areas, it's they're, they're the poorest, poorest areas of each country, these border areas. They feel marginalized, they are marginalized. And be, the border areas, it's where the bandits, it's where the terrorists are, uh, take over. Nobody goes there. Um, so what we decided to do do to we decided to show our presence um, to the populations in those areas. We developed a national program to, on border areas to uh, to work on these border areas. So there were three main characteristics, three main pillars that we are working on. The first is to strengthen the defense of the uh, of our sovereignty and of the territory and this has allowed us to as i to 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 help this the second point is to reduce poverty in those areas and thirdly is to develop a trans border cooperation in those areas to uh, ensure the security of our territories. And so we adopted a new approach to this that is founded on a new form of governance that is includes the, the security, not just of the police and the military, but security is a matter of the citizens as well. And so the focus is on that now. So if we are securing an area, we're securing the populations. So we need to have uh, this in place. Secondly, we have a, a global strategy based on prevention. So the population is at the heart of this. 
Uh, and then we also have brought together the uh, security of the uh, border populations. We have um, put defense forces in these areas and to make sure and also making sure that the population uh, can develop trust in these forces. We also we also have adapted means of mobility in those areas for the police forces and other forces. So we have special units of the police that work the borders and these police forces um, are their role is to secure the communities on the borders. So these forces are working for the populations. They are protecting the population. So their role is to protect the population, not to prosecute anyone. We also have cooperation platforms between uh, different elements of each country. So at each border, we work on both sides of each border and uh, there's cooperation. So if a criminal uh, escapes into another country, we can return them to the origin country. So we have these mechanisms in place that allow to work on both sides of the country. And there's also the... the okay, so religious, religious heads who participate in this activity in this fight against TOC. Secondly, we need to reduce poverty and improve the quality of life of the people. So to help these border populations to get out of poverty and, and this feeling of being abandoned uh, to foster their sense of belonging to, to the country. Uh, we are working on the social side on, in providing drinking water. And we're drilling, um, we're doing solar energy, and we have established this in border areas. Um, we have established 40 posts in these border zones. From a social standpoint, we have built 130 schools And in the, they have been equipped um, we, and we are paying the teachers' salaries. And we're setting up a, um, a, a essentially a, a, a canteen so they can eat at school. And we're establishing um, birth certificates so that children can take examinations because many children in these regions do not have identity papers and therefore cannot go to school. Now we're also organizing um, uh, cons medical consultations so that we can bring doctors from urban zones to these populations who have never had doctors. Um, we have neurologists, uh, dermatologists, uh, etc. Various specialties are being brought to these areas. And we are doing tests for detecting um, uterine cancer in women. And we're uh, looking for examining for cataracts in people's eyes. So a lot of other related specialties and that, you know, for illnesses that affect these populations. Now, from an economic standpoint, um, we are working with women. We're training women. Uh, we bring them to areas where activities are developing and we, for free, give them materials um, and we we build, we set up workshops of where they can work. And so, and we give them operating funds um, so that we are, you know, so for example, women who are working on manioc flowers, flower, uh, which is a very active market in the Niger Valley, 
we are setting up establishments for uh, the preservation of uh, fish. Um, uh, also, shea butter manufacturing is another uh, item that, you know, these are items that are exported. So we've set up many programs uh, for these women so that they can now, with these funds that we're providing for them, they can very quickly be empowered. You know, in Africa, when, when you save one woman, you're saving an entire family. So men are supporting this work. We all have also set up a program uh, for children in these areas. It's financed by the World Bank. And the millions of dollars are being spent on that. It takes care of children, young people who are not going to school, um, when ones who are basically past the first graves. And we give them some funds to get started in their lives. So the World Bank is financing this program. We're also organizing a lot of activities uh, for women uh, to help them make masks against COVID-19 because people don't have the ability to buy these materials, so the, the masks. So we've learned, we've taught them to do it and to make uh, reusable masks in these areas. So this has enabled these populations to have this sense of belonging. Um, it begins with uh, work. They, they working hand in hand with the security sector. So they've become the eyes and ears of the defense and security forces. This means that the state has progressively uh, taken, the, taken the place of, of these criminals that were ruling these border zones previously. So I think that, uh, it, of course, there are items that uh, we have not been able to succeed. I mean, there's still trafficking of fuel that is taking place in these areas. So this is what I can say. This has enabled our border populations to get this sense of belonging to our country, to serve their country, Benin, and and to adopt this uh, system of regional information that promotes prevention and, and puts the citizen at the core of the fight against TOC. So the, the big criminals that were operating in these zones are no longer primary. Thank you very much for having given us the details of the various parts of your efforts in the uh, work against TOC, and also for having emphasized the importance of having this sense of belonging uh, to a country. This feeling of belonging plays a role in this dynamic. So third question, final question, what strategies and what coordination uh, systems uh, should the actors of the security and justice sectors adopt to strengthen their efforts, uh, their fight against TOC in these border and or rural communities? Do you have ideas about these um, cooperation systems that participants in our seminar should consider. Um, the biggest scourge of African countries is that we work in a sectoral manner. We don't, we're not used to working together. This means that in our country since 2016, we've fused police and gendarmerie um, so that they could work together. And essentially, this need for security means that we merge them. This uh, really fixed a coordination issue that we had. There, there are no policers, police officers and gendarmes. They are the same now. They're, they're merged together. There's a strong link between justice and security. Uh, 
and we've created actually a general directorate of judicial police. So everything is um, a resource for the justice system to uh, lead investigations, to transmit information to the judicial system. This is a link between the judicial system, the, the, the tribunals and the police. And thirdly, there's a high level committee that is in charge of the fight against terrorism and security at the borders. It is composed, there's a, there's a president, then there's the minister of the defense, uh, the minister of the interior, uh, the um, head, um, the head of joint staffs, uh, the head of the uh, land terrestrial forces, the director of customs, the director of information uh, services. So this is, they coordinate the various actions that are linked to the securing of border areas. And so you have all these bodies that are uh, represented within that, and they're in charge of securing our borders. So there's Burkina Faso, there's Niger, etc., who who are countries that are under jihadist threats. So this committee t ensures uh, security at these border zones. So this makes it makes it possible for us to work together. In Benin, we. We created um, a court uh, against economic infractions and against terrorism. And this tribunal, this court, is, has a economic and financial brigade, uh, which works mostly on determining who are the economic operators, uh, civil servants, if there's any embezzling of funds going on by those actors. So there's a justice above security, but that's been the traditional role, but now the justice sector works with the security sector hand in hand. So we're taking a judicial approach and, and we've set up a, a structured approach. So in Benin, we've also, we have a unit that deals uh, with tracing of financial flows and monitors them to attract the attention of the government to this aspect. So it is important at a strategic level to implement structures that are capable of coordinating at the highest levels, um, because it is very difficult to coordinate on the operational level. So you need, from a strategic point, but the head of state needs to intervene. The heads of all the departments need to intervene. And then we have better coordination and we, puts us closer to um, controlling this issue. Now, in order to, for a community to be resilient, you need to let the community play its role itself. It needs to be empowered to do so. Um, give it this sense of belonging, which is very important. Then we need a coordination platform of the various actors. Uh, so that we can work hand in hand. Since this fight is national, we have um, to talk about trans-border coordination. We have to know these border areas, but we have to go beyond them so that we can work hand in hand with our neighboring countries. Because what we have noticed is that criminals use these uh, border areas to prosper. A, a criminal that goes through Benin goes to Nigeria or vice versa, or goes to Togo or Burkina Faso. Terrorists are also transiting through. 
So in terms of coordination, what we're doing in Benin, um, it, it, it is very important to do because you can set things up on paper, but you really have to set up a concrete system, coordination at the highest levels where you integrate all the stakeholders so that they can all work together in the same direction. And that means that all the ministries must feel involved in this fight against EOC. And, and so it's not just a matter for the Department Ministry of Defense or Ministry of the Interior. All actors must be heavily involved. And, and that's why the coordination at the highest levels is recommended to deal with this. I've gone over my seven minutes, sorry. And thank you so much for your answers to these three questions. Um, we learned a lot about what Benin and what you are doing in Benin and what are the implications for other countries that are trying to implement a good coordination system. Now let's turn to um, Charles. Charles, I also have three questions for you. Um, so let me begin by asking you to describe what are some of the key features of what transnational organized crime looks like and how it works in urban areas of Africa? where state actors might be hoping to foster coordinated responses? Um, what are some aspects of the urban um, TOC space that, that we should keep in mind? Uh, thank you very much uh, to the Africa Center for St the Strategic Studies for inviting me. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I hope I'm not muted. Yes, we can hear you. Again, yes, thank you. Of, uh, transnational organized uh, crime networks, um, they have become fairly well established. Basically, when we talk about transnational organized crime, we are talking about the activities of uh, professional criminals. Uh, uh, their associates and the institutions which they use or these uh, criminal activities fall into two broad categories. They may be predatory uh, in nature, or they may be market-based market or market-dependent. Now, the three uh, main uh, activity lines that uh, transnational organized criminals are involved in uh, would be the, uh, first of all, the acquisition and supply of uh, illicit goods and illicit commodities uh, in markets which are either there already before the criminals move in or which the criminals create and uh, develop themselves. Uh, some of the goods that they supply are to be used in committing further acts of organized crime. So just to give you an example, the uh, provision of uh, explosives, which may origin, originally have been uh, acquired uh, as uh, lawfully uh, in order to be used in legitimate mining activities, being smuggled across the border to a neighboring country to be used in illegal mining or to be used in committing acts of armed robbery or acts of extortion or even terrorism. Then the second line of uh, activity that they are involved in is the supply of illicit services. For example, the movement of people across borders, whether such movement is in the form of human trafficking or it is in the form of assisting uh, in illegal migration to move people across borders. Uh, another example, it may be the supply of uh, uh, protection services, protection racketeering, which are in fact a form of uh, extortion. But uh, I might say a few more words about that later. The third form of activity is in fact uh, something which only became recognized later. And it arises from the fact that transnational organized criminals have always found it to be in their interest to infiltrate business organizations to infiltrate government institutions. I think my fellow panelist, uh, uh, Dr. 
has already gone uh, some way to exemplify exactly what he's been observing in his part of, of Africa. But um, transnational organized criminals share one common aspiration, which is they want to exert their will throughout a given territory uh, by means of power in any form. They want to uh, use that. Now, this ambition has in turn come to be listed as a third characteristic of transnational organized uh, criminals, which is namely their tendency to infiltrate business entities and to infiltrate government uh, institutions. The critical factor which runs through most transnational organized crime, crime networks in Africa is that they need to, and they constantly evaluate their relationship with the communities in which they exist, uh, with the businesses which they, um, uh, which they, they may infiltrate or use or steal from or compete with. They also need to understand and always evaluate their relationship with the governments in the countries in which the criminal markets that they operate uh, exist. Now for that reason, that is what makes them particularly uh, dangerous and versatile because they constantly must reevaluate their relationship and, and renew it. Um, now, they, there are other things which have facilitated and enabled organized criminal networks to, to, to really uh, thrive. The one, especially when one is talking about urban centers in Africa, the one factor is that uh, these urban centers are experiencing very rapid population growth. And again, the growth of that population has been mainly in the uh, increase, rapid increase in the number of uh, uh, young people, uh, people who are entering the job market, but who are not able to access any jobs in the job market. At the same time, and of course, uh, with the various uh, shocks to which African economies have been exposed from time to time, some people who have been in employment are losing their jobs. So the number of unemployed people has kept rising. I think uh, a, a report by the World Economic Forum uh, back in 2018, and it was not the only report on this, said Africa's urban centers are experiencing the most rapid growth of any urban centers in the world, uh, of any urban centers anywhere. But this is occurring uh, on a continent whose governments are still struggling to really get over post-colonial transitions, still struggling to really establish sovereignty. As my colleague has just been saying in his remarks that in some border areas, the state just didn't exist or still doesn't exist. So uh, transnational organized criminals have really found such gaps to be fatal uh, for them to infiltrate. So that I would say those are some of the features of uh, transnational organized criminals that we are noticing on the African continent. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for that answer and that snapshot of some of the key things to look at from the urban perspective. Let me follow up with another question for you, uh, Mr. Gordema. You have many years of experience analyzing criminal actors in urban Africa and in working with national and regional anti-money laundering institutions to counter transnational organized crime. So could you describe the kinds of coordination that anti-money laundering institutions, which are often urban based, they're based in the capital usually, mm -hmm. What kinds of coordination are, are they engaging in with security actors and citizens in order to gather the intelligence that they need um, in urban and rural settings to counter transnational organized crime? Yes, I think one of the things that uh, anti-money laundering uh, agencies quickly realized about transnational organized crime networks is because transnational organized crime is a big driver, a big contributor to money laundering is that these criminals thrive in uh, de-territorialized markets. 
In other words, in uh, markets which do not recognize and are not uh, defined or impeded by territorial boundaries. So anti-money laundering uh, agencies quickly realized that they had to improve their access to information about the what was happening about the movement of uh, money of illicit money so they quickly established networks uh, both internal or domestic within their government their, 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 their territory their national boundaries and also cross border with other uh, anti-money laundering agencies outside their borders so we find structures such as the Egmont Group of Financial Intelligence Units, for example, was founded on the basis of that understanding that if you confined anti-money laundering agencies to their territorial limits, then you would not be able to succeed against the main drivers of uh, illicit financial movements of, of capital. And I think that is a lesson which uh, for law enforcement, for security and justice uh, operatives uh, is a lesson which has to be learned and has to be taken on board. To a certain extent, it has, because we have a structure such as Interpol, for example, and all its, uh, its uh, regional bureaus uh, spread across Africa, for example. Again, it is uh, influenced by the understanding that you are better at accessing information about what happens beyond your borders if you are networking constantly with, uh, with others uh, across. But uh, one failing or one area where progress has not yet been achieved to the extent that it must be is um, in the use of crime intelligence information in order to develop profiles of uh, transnational organized crime networks in real time. Because these crime networks, as we have heard from my colleague, comprise not just of the professional criminals, but they also consist of the so-called state actors who fight from their activities as well. They also comprise of foreign actors. Again, uh, they have been, uh, that point has been raised by my quite uh, multi-dimensional uh, insofar as their membership and also their, their operations. So the uh, crime profile, uh, crime network profiling that should happen I don't think is happening consistently. It is happening in some areas, and notably the area of uh, trafficking of wildlife and wildlife products. In uh, the part of the world which I'm most familiar with, East and Southern Africa, we have a structure such as the Losaka Agreement Task Force, the LATF, which was established back in the late 90s, 1996, uh, specifically to take a much more concentrated look at the crime networks that are active in the area of uh, trafficking of wildlife products from African countries all the way to Southeast Asia. And uh, it has achieved quite a bit of success, I would say, but it is a model that needs to, to be developed. Uh, it, when they, when, when we, we, we really get serious about crime network profiling, then we will quickly realize that they are the available information that is required in order to carry out the, a range of partners. Some of them are outside the public sector, others are in the public sector. Uh, we, in the private sector, some of these structures have already uh, gone some way to uh, do their own crime network profiling. So I'll just stop there.
Thank you so much, um, Charles, for highlighting also, yes, this important aspect of where, what does the, a public-private partnership look like? Where does the private sector fit into some of this crime network profiling and other, and other measures um, for gathering intelligence that we need to deal with crime in urban and rural areas? Final question for you. Um, so uh, in essence, what strategies and coordination mechanisms do you think security and justice sector actors could think about adopting to enhance their work to counter transnational organized crime, particularly um, in urban areas of Africa? Yeah, well, urban areas are where the concentrations of uh, the potential victims for transnational organized happen to live and to operate. So that is where organized crime is most visible and most active. And that is also where these uh, coordination mechanisms uh, must really take, take root. There are many, many examples, but uh, a, a strategic appraisal that is centered around the evaluation of threats and consequences, uh, which underlie uh, contemporary national uh, money laundering risk assessment, for example. It might be useful to replicate uh, what is being done in anti-money laundering risk assessments in respect of transnational organized crime. And that will tell us what kind of strategies and coordination mechanisms should really be adopted. For national risk assessments, uh, threats are recognized as a combination of the volume of economic crime in the economy and the susceptibility or vulnerability of the different sectors to being or to falling victim. Uh, or to being exploited uh, in the laundering of proceeds of crime. Now, when you move that model to transnational organized crime, similarly, you would also want to uh, examine uh, who are the likely targets of organized crime networks? What are the red flag indicators to that these likely victims should look out for. Uh, and then that will tell you who should be the partners to coordinate your activities with. At the moment, within the government sector, and like my fellow panelists have said, there is some movement in, uh, for example, integrating the police and the gendarmerie and within the police to set up specialized units to investigate priority crimes or financial crimes. Beyond the government sector, my worry is that uh, the other potential partners in that coordination, specifically organized business and civil society may not actually be moving at the same pace or in the same direction as what is happening in the government sector. Um, but there are examples to learn from. I think in South Africa, there has been a lot of movement, uh, certainly because business organized itself relatively early and it could actually offer a coordination mechanism to government, which was already functioning within government to protect its own members from organized crime. It could come to government and say, look, we already have a structure whereby we collect and share information would you not like to have access to this information? And government naturally found that to be useful. In the civil society extension then came about a subsequent to that, but the major motivation that really pushed things along was the uh, organization of the 2010 FIFA World Cup in South Africa. That really uh, moved a lot, things a, a lot faster in bringing up uh, business and government together and also civil society. Because suddenly government realized that alone without coordinating with the two other structures, it would never be able to successfully run a, a FIFA World Cup or a mega sports event such as the 2010 FIFA World Cup. And we saw some structures that were set up in 2010 have been sustained beyond 2010 over the last 11 years, some of them have continued to exist and that impetus has really been uh, uh, maintained. So I would say, yes, um, 
the coordination partners cannot just be identified maybe in advance. They need to really uh, be built on the basis of practical actual networking based on your appreciation or an appreciation of what the nature of the problem is in a given country. Thank you for that answer. Um, and um, yeah, I guess for bringing the FIFA World Cup into our discussion of national security today. It's, <laughs> it makes sense that certain coordination structures might be multifaceted and work across a lot of different um, things that we might be concerned about or thinking about in a country. So that's very interesting what you bring up.